Hi, everyone. Welcome to a special seminar of the um, Broad MIA series. That's Models, Inference, and Algorithms. For those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's regularly scheduled every week at 9.30 a.m. with a primer talk at 8.30 to 9.30 a.m. So for the non-Broad people, be aware of it. It's a great seminar. And we have uh, lots of smart and interesting people every week. Um, now to introduce the speaker, we have David Shea from Stanford University. So he has not been interested in biology for most of his career. He's an information theory expert. He literally wrote a book on wireless communications. And in a huge number of third and fourth generation, whatever that means, wireless devices in the world, it, his algorithms are making them work. Um, recently, in the last few years, he's been interested in applying information theory to problems of assembly. And that's what introduced most of, most of us in the crowd today. And without further ado, I will give the microphone to David. OK. So um, today, we're going to talk about uh, the science of information. And I want to use two examples, which should be very familiar to people here. Uh, DNA assembly and RNA assembly to illustrate the power of the science of information. A more sexy title should be How to Solve NP-Hot Problems in Linear Time. Now, this is a very bold title, and you will know at the end of the talk whether this is a justified subtitle or not. Okay, so this research is supported by the NSF Center for Science of Information. All right, so I'm going to say a few words about the roots of the science of information. And then I'm going to talk about the two assembly problem. So science of information started with uh, a paper in 1948 by Claude Shannon. Okay? So in Claude Shannon, he, in, in this paper in 1948, he wants to solve the communication problem. In other words, the problem of communicating a source to its destination, and the destination is interested in reconstructing the source. Okay? In his paper, he proved three main theorems. First, he said that if you want to compress a source, the minimum rate of compression is this entropy rate, H. So in this theorem, he ties a t concept from statistics, uh, sorry, from physics, statistical physics actually, to the communication problem. Two, he showed that if you compute an expression called a mutual information, that characterizes the fastest rate of communication over the channel. And three is that he shows that if h is less than i, that is the entropy is less than the rate over the channel, that you can communicate reliably. Okay, so three theorems, and that is the uh, landmark paper. So the funny thing about this paper is that they actually the paper actually never told you how to do anything. Basically, it never write down based an algorithm. There may be one or two algorithms, but that's not the focus of the paper. On the other hand, it tells you what is possible from an information point of view. So it took about 60 years. And after 60 years, people finally figure out how to do all this thing computationally efficiently. Okay? So not only the theory has become a benchmark for designing various schemes, more interestingly for us, today is that now, after 60 years, there exist computationally efficient coding schemes. Okay? So first, 60 years earlier, he said, this is possible, but I don't know how, I'm not telling you how to do it. People worked hard for 60 years, so I guess it, pro it is a kind of a job providing um, uh, paper, provides a lot of people with their academic careers to how to find codes to achieve the information limits. Okay. So there's something strange going on here. So let us tease out a little bit about the issues involved in this 60 years history and how, what we can learn from it and perhaps apply to uh, other problems. So here we have the two uh, found fathers of communication and computation, the two sort of foundations of information technology. Uh, so Shannon in 1948 asked the following question. He said, what is the information limit for communication? OK. Uh, Turing, being a computation guy, he said, hey, wait a minute. You never talk about computation. In other words, you never talk about how much computation do you need in order to reach the information limit. 
OK? Uh, in fact, after a while, people figure out, I should say Turing's descendants figure out, that if you are looking at codes, then the problem of optimal decoding of codes is actually NP-hard. NP-hard. So Turing probably smiled at Shannon and said, look, you know, you're talking about limit, but you'll never be able to get there. All right? Uh, but then Shannon has a response to this. Shannon said, well, actually, NP-hardness is a measure, a worst case measure of complexity over all pop instances of the problem. But Shannon said, I don't really care about all instances of the problem. I only care about the instance of the problem for which I can actually decode the original information. Okay? And it turns out that if you restrict to those problem instances, 60 years of history tells us that indeed computationally efficient algorithms exist to achieve those limits. Okay? So that's the 60 year story, the backstory. So now I want to show that this same principle can be extended to apply to other problems as a design principle to other large scale computational problems. So the two problems I'm going to focus on should be very familiar with, to the community here, hopefully. Uh, so I won't go too much into motivating why they're important. The number one problem to talk about is de novo DNA assembly, okay? So here's the problem, all right, the DNA assembly problem. So I have a genome of length G, mathematically is a sequence S of AGCT symbols, okay? All right, uh, ranges from 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 9 and even longer for plants, etc. So very long sequence in general. Um, Shotgun sequencing is the primary way of getting information about the sequence from current technology. So I have reads from unknown locations, all right? Short, relatively short reads, shorter than the genome length for sure, uh, of strengths generated from the shotgun sequencing technology, okay? And then the computation is the assembler which is to try to glue these reads together to get back a sequence which hopefully is very close to the original sequence. Okay? So this is the DNA assembly problem. All right? So, well, this is a problem. So let's ask ourselves first, before we talk about the problem, which what do we know about the theory for assembly, okay? So in communication, Shannon set up the basic theory, and then people in practice worked very hard, and finally able to design very efficient communication system. 60 years later, everybody is talking on the cell phone, thanks to Shannon, okay? So every time you talk to yourself on your cell phone, think a little bit about it, you know? Shannon is the guy who actually enabled that to happen. All right, so let's ask the same question for the assembly problem. Okay, so again, we can bring out our two favorite heroes here, Shannon and Turing, and you can sort of take two points of view on this assembly problem, okay? The first point of view is the computation point of view, computation point of view, and that is the prevalent point of view because assembly is a very large-scale computational problem. Very naturally, you start with the computational point of view, okay? So the typical approach of trying to come up with a theory for assembly, which has been done in various papers, is to formulate the assembly problem as some sort of combinatorial optimization problem, okay? For example, there's this problem called the shortest common superstring, which is to find the shortest string that contains all the reads. That seems a very natural problem. You try to find a very compact representation, and hopefully that is a good answer. Or you can represent as a graph and formulate as a Hamiltonian path problem. Okay? And there are many other such formulations okay, that you can look in the literature. Uh, bad news is that they're typically NP hard. It seems that any problem you come up with is basically just NP hard. And you can write a nice paper and prove that it's empty heart. By the end of the day, it's still empty heart. Okay? Uh, and then 
the community, the assembly people, the people here in Bro, for example, say, ah, oh, forget about this theory, it's useless. It's empty hard. So let's just throw a bunch of heuristics and then build some assembler and try it out on real data and see what happens. Okay? So that is essentially sort of uh, the main sort of uh, thought about the theory. Now, if we take a different point of view, from the information point of view, then the starting point is different. The starting point is different. The first starting point question is not a commutation question, but really the question of, well, our goal is to reconstruct the genome to as best as we can. We can ask the question, for example, how much data do I need? How much read data do I need in order to enable me to do an ambiguous reconstruction of the genome? Okay, that is the information question. It is not a computation question because I haven't even worried about how fast I can compute, okay? So the hope is that by asking this question, it can lead us to designing algorithms efficiently by focusing only on the information feasible instances. So in other words, this question may help me to delineate the space of problems. So instead of looking at worst case, we can look at the instances which is information feasible. And hopefully, the question is, can this avoid empty hardness, like in the communication problem? Okay? So that is the, uh, what we're trying to do here. All right? So I'm an information theorist, so I'm taking this point of view. Now, this point of view is certainly not originated from me. In fact, if you look back at very old history of assembly, there is already a paper which asks a question related to information. And this paper is by Lender and Waterman. Okay? Anybody in assembly should know about this paper. People in Broad here should know about, you know, at least the author of this paper. Okay? So Lender and Waterman in 1988 wrote a paper, okay? which asked the following question, all right? If I want to reconstruct this genome, then at least I should try to cover the genome, okay? They actually asked a more general question, which is, uh, what's the number of reads I need, all right, in order to achieve a certain number of gaps, minimum number of gaps? But a special case of this would be asking the question of, how much data do I need to cover the genome with high probability? All right, to cover the genome with high probability, to leave no gap, all right? So this is a Lander Waterman coverage, famous coverage statistic. It is an information question. It is not a question about computational complexity. It is a question of how much data do I need in order to have any chance of assembling the genome, right? It is an information question. Now, the caveat here, though, is that this question, the answer to this question, which is very quite relatively easy to uh, solve, it's not sufficient to, it's not strong enough to become a guiding principle for design. Because, basically because this number, let's call it NLW, in honor of Lander and Waterman, NLW, uh, only provides a lower bound on the number of reads to reconstruct. Certainly you need at least that much, but it's not sufficient to have that number in general. It's not clear it's sufficient, at least. Because the fact that you can cover the genome doesn't mean that you can reconstruct the genome. And in fact, the funny thing about this number and Leonard Waterman is that it doesn't depend on anything about the DNA sequence itself. Now, for anyone who works in assembly, this is a kind of intuitive because obviously there are genomes which are highly complex, and their genomes, which are much simpler. And so you would think that the amount of data you need to assemble different types of genomes should be different. The fact that this number does not depend on DNA sequence itself is already a sort of red flag that this approach, this analysis by itself, by itself, is not really powerful enough to get what we want, which is to use it to drive the design of efficient assembly. 
And in fact, the key challenge of assembly, as everyone knows, is repeats. You have a lot of repeats in genome. Repeats confound, potentially confound, assembly. Okay? So thinking about assembly problem as a jigsaw puzzle, we know that if we want to put together jigsaw puzzle from small pieces, then puzzles which have a lot of repeats are actually more difficult than puzzles which have relatively few repeats. Okay, so intuitively, intuitively, we know that the information complexity of assembly should somehow depend on repeats of the sequence. Okay, so mathematically, what we want is to establish this connection in a clear way, in an explicit way, so that we can use it as a principle for designing algorithms to get close to those limits. Okay, all right. So uh, about three years ago, we wrote a paper on this topic, okay, with uh, Guy Bressler and Marion Bressler, okay. Um, so there, we asked the following question, which is this. Suppose I give you a particular genome. This is an example, chromosome 19, okay. You go, can use, uh, you know, Mummer to compute some repeat statistics of the genome, okay? And now here's the curve that I have. For example, you can plot as a function of the length of the repeat, how many repeats are there of that length on the genome, okay? So typically when you're very short, you have lots of repeats and as long as uh, smaller, but you have uh, a bunch of relatively long repeats. Okay, this is a typical repeat distribution of a genome, right? Okay, so you give me the sequence. And now, given a statistic like this, what we showed in that paper 19, in a few years ago is we are able to compute a curve, okay? So let's try to understand what this curve is because I'll refer to this curve a few times in your talk, okay? All right, so in the x-axis, so basically there are two key parameters to figure out the information complexity of assembly, okay? One is the length of the read. That's one key parameter. The longer, the better, right? And two is the coverage depth, how many reads you need in your experiment. So to characterize the information complexity, I need to characterize in terms of these two numbers. So here's the read length L, and here is N, the number of reads, okay? So I could, because Landon Waterman is such an important, you know, Landon is such an important person here, so now I honor him by dividing him, by dividing N by him, okay? So this is a number which is normalized by Landon Waterman coverage, okay? Right? So one means this is Landon Waterman coverage, all right? So it could be, you know, 25 or something like that for human genome and some smaller number, 17 or 18 for bacteria, okay? Coverage depth, 70x. But I just normalize it by one here. All right? So this curve is what I call an information low bound. Okay? So Landon Waterman tells me that below one, you can't assemble because you haven't covered the sequence. This curve combines with Landon Waterman tells me that there's a stronger constraint. There's a stronger constraint. And that stronger constraint depends on this repeat statistic. Okay? The stronger constraint depends on this repeat statistic. It tells me that if your N and L is below here, then with then you basically cannot reconstruct. Okay? Now Sorry? This is a finishing, yes. This is complete reconstruction. The theory started at this point. Mm -hmm. I'll, mention, I'll discuss a little bit about partial assembly later on. Okay. Good. So, of course, this curve is uh, with respect to a particular probability of success, I should mention a little bit, right? Just like Leonard Waterman coverage, you say you want to cover it with probably 99%. So this is similar to that. Say with probably 99% you want to reconstruct, 
then this is a low bound. That is, if n and l is on the left of this curve, then you cannot reconstruct with probability 99%. Okay? All right. Yes? Uh, yes, it is strong. It is, it is uh, driven strongly with the largest repeat I have, but it's, all, it's also due to the fact that this longest repeat around here is pretty sparse. Okay, so if this was very a lot of repeats at the long largest one, then this curve would be very different. Okay, all right. Okay. But I'll, I'll elaborate more on that point. That's an important point. Okay, so that's information low bound. So I want to do now two things. Two things for this low bound. One is I want to explain a little bit how this low bound come about. Okay? And two is I want to use the insight from understanding how this low bound come about to actually design an algorithm to get close to this low bound. Okay? Now, at this point, this is... Uh, by the way, there is a strange number here, vertical number, called L critical. And you can notice that this curve actually steeps very sharp. And so you can think of this as like a critical read length, below which you cannot reconstruct. And above which, if it's slightly above, like you know, 10% or 20% above, then your read length, then your coverage depth of land and waterman is pretty good, pretty sufficient. Okay? So just a feature of this curve. So now let me understand the low. So the low bound is actually due to two types of bottleneck repeats. Okay. So number one bottleneck repeat, the first one is called interleave repeat. Okay. So here's an example repeat. Red, red is one repeat. Yellow, yellow is another repeat. They interleave together. Okay. So x, y, x, y. Okay. And here are the reads that are placed on the genome. These are the reads that are actually sampled from the genome in this example. I claim that there's a special feature of this situation which enables, which not enables, which causes ambiguity in the reconstruction. So what's happening here? If you notice, there is a Golden Gate Bridge. I'm from the Bay Area, my, my daughter's favorite bridge. Golden Gate Bridge. In fact, it's the only bridge she knows about. Okay. Uh, very excited about this bridge every time we cross there. And the bridge say, says that basically no read goes from left to right of any of these four copies. Okay. All right. So this is a lack of bridging. I claim that if this condition, if this situation is, then there's intrinsic ambiguity in the reconstruction. And the reason is the following. If I take this green thing part and the reads that touches it, and I take the purple part and the purple reads that touches it, and if I swap the two parts, if I swap the two parts, then the first genome and the second genome, the likelihood of observing those reads are identical, okay, under a classical Poisson uniform sampling model, okay? So therefore, lack of bridging of these interleave repeat is an intrinsic uncertainty to the problem. And so therefore, a necessary condition for success is that all interleave repeats, all interleave repeats on the genome, okay, are bridged, all right? All interleave repeats are bridged. In particular, it says that L should be greater than the longest interleave repeat length. And this is a result earlier by Yukonen. So this result by Bressler, uh, Bressler, and Shea is a generalization of the early result by Yukone. So now the question earlier by this gentleman would say is that is the condition very dependent, uh, only dependent on the longest repeat? And the answer is no, because the condition actually depends on bridging of all interleave repeats, whether they're long or short. So in some sense, it depends on all interleave repeat. However, because in genomes, typically the long ones um, have a pretty big gap with the next longest one, it becomes that the condition of bridging the long ones are sort of the bottleneck, okay? Maybe the long one and the second long one, okay? All right, so that's an interesting insight. And in some sense, that is why that curve is very steep coming down. But I can discuss that offline. Okay, now the second condition 
The second condition is triple repeats, okay? So it turns out that there are only two types of repeats that determine that line. Triple repeat is another example. And again, if you have a triple repeat that is x, 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 and you have no bridging, then again, you can do the swap that we had earlier, okay? Very similar. So the necessary condition, again, is all triple repeat a bridge. And so L is greater than the longest triple uh, repeat length, okay? Because if it is not longer, then you cannot, definitely you cannot bridge it. So that's a necessary condition. But here we have a bridging condition. Now that curve is basically by, calcula by calculating, sort of mathematically, what is the probability of these events happening, basically, not bridging events happening. It's not a very difficult calculation, so I won't go into the details of the calculation. But the important thing is are these conditions. Okay, so, okay, so now a quiz. Quiz. You got the free food, and now it's a quiz time. And the quiz is, what is this L critical for a given genome? What is L critical? Okay, people totally lost. Bad news. L critical is the longest repeat. Longest triple or, lo or interleave repeat. It's the maximum of the longest triple and the longest interleave repeat. Indeed, it is. So this line is determined very much by the longest one. And then this curve drops very sharply after that. And it's because mainly it's bridging of these long repeats. Yes? In, in defense of the audience here, we didn't say, I guess for perfect reconstruction of the genome, then there's an interval like that. But for the case where you want to say, I want to have X number of gaps in the genome, Yes, but obviously that problem is, sorry, not honest? No, it's not perfectly obvious in terms of how many distributions. Yes. So obviously, um, so in information theory, there are two kinds of reconstruction problem. One is reconstruction perfectly, and two is reconstruction to within a fidelity. Reconstruction perfectly is an easier problem, so we start with that one. Without that one, without answering this question, it's probably harder to come up with a theory of reconstruction to within a certain number of gaps or whatever, yeah. So we're working on that problem. Okay, so now we answered the first question, which is where the low band comes from. The second question I want to answer is how do I approach the limit? In other words, how do I find an algorithm that approaches the limit? In our original paper, we have an algorithm actually, but this more recent work come up with a totally different class of algorithm. And I think this gives more insight as to how the information and computation complexity interact. And this is joint work with my postdoc, uh, uh, Ilan Shmoranian and uh, Professor Tom Corte from Berkeley. Okay, so we start with a very classical architecture for assembly called a read overlap graph. So uh, I'm sure a lot of people are familiar just in case. Uh, here we represent each read as a node in the graph, okay? So here the reads are length five, all right? I draw an edge between graphs and I give them a number and that number is the amount of overlap between the reads, okay? So here's a read, for example, A, C, G, C, A. It overlaps with C, A, T, T, C in the last two C, A. So it gives them a two. And what is the possible reconstruction here, a possible reconstruction should be a sequence that visits every single node because the sequence should have a read. So by the way, here I'm focusing on an idealistic error-free case, error-free case. I'll talk a little bit about errors later on, but that's not the focus of today. Okay, there's a sequence is a path that visits every node, okay? So for example, let's look at the red one, okay? The red one, if you put them all together, you'll get the sequence A, C, G, C, A, T, T, C, G, C, G, okay? All right, which is the basic concatenation of these nodes. All right, so a very natural formulation of this problem is the so-called generalized Hamiltonian path problem, which is to find a path that goes through all nodes, goes through all nodes with the minimum cost, or in, in this case, maximum overlap, <coughs> maximum sum of overlaps, okay? So this is a Hamiltonian path problem. Just like any other problem you get from assembly is NP-hard, okay? Is NP-hard. 
It's almost like a meta theorem that any problem we come up with in assembly is empty hard. Okay? All right. Um, so basically, in practice, what you see is you have, you know, 100 million nodes and huge number of edges, huge number of edges. So you look at it and you get a headache already. In fact, you can't even look at it. It's, it's just too, too complex. All right? So you have to extrapolate from this picture. This picture may have only 20 nodes, you know? But the complexity of this graph is just stunning, stunning. And to find a shortest Hamiltonian path is just horribly impossible. So let's start with the simplest algorithm, right? We should always start with something very simple and see what, how far that simple thing will go. So the simple thing we start with is the simplest algorithm that one can think of, even my four-year-old daughter can think of, which is the greedy algorithm. You basically try to pick only an edge with the best overlap. So in other words, what you try to do is essentially simplify this graph. This graph is too complicated. We've got to throw away some edges. So the greedy is very, shall I say, greedy. Because it just in, keeps one out of many edges. OK? Only one out of many edges. When that one edge is the one with the largest overlap. OK? All right. So in this example, these are the green. All right, the green edges are the ones that greedy keeps. OK? Now, the question is, OK? The question is, is this uh, OK? Maybe this algorithm already get to the information limit. In which case, I'm not going to be here talking. OK? But uh, that's a possibility. So question, what if they're long repeats, right? So the whole thing's got repeats. So here's a repeat, OK? And suppose a read that is a node on this graph is actually from within the repeat, OK? So here's an example. So in other words, I have a node, all right, which goes to two places. So what does that mean? That means that in the true solution, there exists two outgoing edges, at least two outgoing edges from this particular node, because this guy occurs twice in the two repeats. OK, so that means that the graph, the path, must come back to this node at least one more time. So therefore, the generalized Hamiltonian path should look like this. And therefore, the greedy approach will fail in this example. So greedy approach actually fails when there are long repeats. OK? Our low bound did not say that whenever we have unbridged long repeats, we fail. We only say unbridged interleave or triple repeat. So there's a gap, actually. There's a gap between what greedy can achieve okay, and the lower bound. OK? And the lower bound. Uh, now, you may say, well, OK, there's a gap, but maybe a lower bound sucks. Maybe a lower bound is just bad. OK? It could be. Maybe greed is good. Um, of course, otherwise, I wouldn't be here. It turns out that we can push much closer to the low bound. Okay? And to push much closer to the low bound, we need to be greedy, but not so greedy. Okay? And the trick is how to be not so greedy. Okay. So what does the information limit tell us how to be not so greedy? OK, so the information, so now we, we at this point understand that if we want to push further, we need to visit a node more than once. So that we learn from greedy. Now, more than once could mean twice, or three, or four, or five times. So this is many possibilities. So we should ask the question well, do I need to visit a node more than twice? OK, so let's see. All right, so this example, we have visited more than twice, I believe, one, two, oh, no, not this example. Yeah, I think it's more than twice. Yes, we we'll visit those three times. So here's an example where I visit three times. OK? So this is an example where we have a triple repeat, which is not bridged. So now, if I swap them, that's effectively saying that I could go blue first and then red, or red first and then blue. Okay? 
So that means that if I visit, if I have to have, a, if my true path forces me to visit no three times, then there will be an intrinsic uncertainty detected by my information limit. So this problem instance would be a point outside this feasible region anyway. So if my goal is to do reconstruction, perfect reconstruction, then I should not worry about this point. This point is out of, out of bound. Okay? And so therefore, I only need to constrain myself to look at path that visit each node less than two, two, two times if I want to get this region, which is feasible. Okay? So there will be a lot of details about this algorithm, but basically, it does the following. Okay? Instead of greedy, what's greedy? It keeps the best extension or the maximum overlap. This algorithm keeps the best overlap and something else. That something else is almost like the second best overlap, but not quite. It's the second best overlap such that it gives you something different from the first overlap in the extension. Okay? That's what it does. Furthermore, you can prune, you can prune to remove spurious edges, okay? And the result will be a very sparse read overlap graph whose out degree and in degree is no more than two at each node, okay? So, the, yes, yes. Spurious means edges that are not on the genome. No, 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 no. Here there are no sequencing error. Here there are no sequencing error. So let me, actually the next slide will explain a little bit more about the spurious, okay? So the performance guarantee, so I'm elaborating on that word then, is the following, okay? If all triple repeats are all bridged, okay? Then no spurious and no missing edges in the sparse graph. So no missing, let me explain the two concepts. No missing edges means that if there's an edge which has to be there of, of, the, of the genome, then this edge has to be in the sparse graph. So I haven't thrown stuff away that is important, okay? No spurious edges, that means there's no extra edges, okay? That means the genome should contain all the edges on this graph. So what does that mean? It means that if you have a graph which has no spurious and no missing edges, then the genome is actually a Eulerian path in this graph. What is a Eulerian path? A Eulerian path is the path that goes through every edge exactly once. Okay? So this theorem basically says that if under this condition, then this graph is a Eulerian, genome is a Eulerian path. Furthermore, theorem two says that if all interleave repeats are bridged, if all interleave repeats are bridged, then there's only one such Eulerian path, and this is the true genome. So in other words, under these two conditions, interleave repeats bridge and triple repeat all bridge, okay, right? Then we have, we can construct the genome using a Eulerian algorithm, okay? So, okay, so let me say a few words. So now, greedy is here, and you can now compute the chewability of not so greedy, which is basically under those two conditions. All triple repeats are all bridge, and all interleave repeats are bridge. So you may ask two things. One is actually not so greedy is pretty close to low bound. But actually it's not exactly the same as low bound. All right, so one more test. Why is it not exactly the same as low bound? Well, because I'm kind of sliding something under the rug here. There's the word all here. So in fact, we need the triple repeats to be all bridge. So before the bridging condition was only one of the three copies bridge, that's enough. Here we need all three copies to bridge, okay? And uh, that's the nature of the proof. We couldn't really get it to exactly match the condition, okay? But fortunately for us, the gap is relatively small. 
And it turns out to be relatively small for a bunch of genomes, quite a lot. It turns out that essentially interleaved repeats are kind of the bottleneck for a lot of genomes, okay? Not triple repeat. All right. So, all right. So what we got was basically um, we solved the NP-hot problem in linear time, basically. Okay, do I deserve some medal here or something like that? There must be some prize waiting for me to collect now. Okay, uh, so what happened? So the general problem of read overlap graph is NP-hot, okay? But if I look at all instances of the problem, all instances of the problem, is MP hard, but if I only focus on the information feasible instances, okay, then they can be solved linear time by constructing this sparse read overlap graph by running an Eulerian on it, okay? So basically that's the insight. Now I'm cheating a little bit here because I cannot get all the grid points on the above the low bound. I can get most of the points, okay? So the, stud, the result is still not completely uh, uh, 100%. But pretty good. Okay, so this is a important picture, I think, because if you if people for people familiar with assembly, okay, we we know that there's interesting development assembly, because read overlap graph is kind of the starting point of assembly. I think that's the sort of a natural data structure. At some point, at some point, a bunch of people came by and said, "Hey, no, 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 no." We want to try to reduce the problem to a Eulerian problem by using this structure called the Bruin graph. The Bruin graph, okay? But for me, as the information theory, there was a one thing missing in this story, which is in what cases does Eulerian, because we know Eulerian can be solved in linear time and Hamiltonian is then be hard. So there must be some trick here. So in what instances does this reduction to Eulerian not lose any information. So I think this result answered to some extent to say that if you focus on the information feasible instances, then Eulerian does not lose any information. Okay? So that um, is sort of where we are. So um, what we're trying to do right now, right now, is to try to apply some of these ideas to actual uh, data. So actual data, so what is the natural application of this thing is a long read assembly. Because here we're focusing on sort of these long repeats and you need very long reads to bridge them. So long read assembly sequencing data turns out that it has very high error rate, okay? 10, 15% pack bar reads, uh, nanopore reads and so, so forth. So, but you can sort of abstract, and, and our theory doesn't really talk about errors. But you can sort of abstract the errors away by doing the following, and that's what we're doing now. We use an overlapper to basically compute approximate alignment between all the reads, okay? This could be like G minus D aligner, or it could be like mini map here. You compute alignments and you create the graph. And once you create the graph, it becomes like a read overlap graph, but the alignments are approximate. And then you can run sort of what we do here, not so greedy, and you can get an output, okay? So we tried out very initial, this very initial result, we just tried out on an E. coli data set, uh, PEG bio reads, okay, which is solidly in the, in the interior of the region. And um, we ran our algorithm, and then we actually can reconstruct. So these are the two strands, blue and red, two strands. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, I'm cheating a little bit because it's not so greedy 2.0, meaning that we have to make some modification to the basic architecture to get this to work. Okay, but uh, the hope is that uh, we can broaden this out to other situations. Okay, so I don't know. I'm kind of running a bit out of time here, so I don't know whether we should continue with the RNA assembly story. Anyone wants to see some real software results? All right, okay. So this Broad Institute, after all. So in that case, I will go quickly by the theory. 
And then, so let me say a few words. Someone asked, hey, maybe we're not interested in um, perfect assembly. We are interested in just getting whatever we can get, okay? So the hope is that this theory can be extended to that situation. We have some initial results, but it's not sort of presentable to this audience yet. Is that if you want to reconstruct partially, then if you find an appropriate distortion metric, then hopefully the complexity to achieve this distortion will also be low. That's the hope. Okay, we got some initial results on that. Okay, so let's quickly talk about the de novo RNA assembly, which is joint work with my former postdoc Sriram Kanan and Leo Pachter at Berkeley. So, uh, so maybe I should go quickly. So you have uh, RNA transcripts. Okay, these are the transcripts, and these are alternate splice isoforms, and the is spliced from the exon. So the transcriptome is the set of all transcripts with uh, different abundances, typically. And the RNA-seq assembly problem is to gather reads from the transcriptome and reconstruct from the reads to the transcriptome. And I'm interested in the de novo problem, where I don't have a reference. I don't have a reference genome. I don't have a reference transcriptome. OK? So we can apply sort of similar philosophy to RNA-seq assembly. And we should focus on one of the bottleneck repeats, okay? Bottleneck repeats. Okay, so there are basically two types of repeats in RNA transcriptome, okay? One is intra-transcript repeat. That is repeat along each transcript, okay? Those are like the DNA repeats. But the more interesting repeat are the inter-transcript repeat. That is, these are repeats across different transcripts or isoforms due to the fact that they share exons, okay? These are much longer, typically, than intratranscript repeats. And these are typically bottlenecks in the combination problem. So our theory is addressing these bottlenecks. Okay, so again, just like the DNA problem, I want to identify repeat patterns that are bottlenecks. So here's an example. So S3 is shared between these two transcripts. And this S3 is a repeat and is not bridged by any reads, okay? All right. So I claim that you have ambiguity here because I can swap S4 and S5 and you can't really tell them apart because the reads cannot, go, cannot bridge to S3. So this is an ambiguity, okay? So therefore, you can generate the other two transcripts, okay? So in fact, you could have even four transcripts, four possible transcripts. So you have uh, multiple solutions to this problem, non-unique, okay? So this is bad pattern. But if you notice about this example, okay, there's something interesting about this example, is that I'm assuming here that the read coverage is the same on these two transcripts, okay? But that's not very common because in practice, there's a wide range of abundances across the transcripts, okay? So it turns out that if you assume that the abundances are generic, that is, they're different, then you really can't make that swap anymore. Why? Because if I swap, then the coverage will look funny in the two transcripts, okay? So you assume reasonably uniform coverage on the transcript, then this case can be ruled out, and this, okay? However, it turns out that we can still analyze and find some repeat patterns which are unresolvable, okay? Even with generic abundances, okay? So let's go through this example. So for example, I can take some reads here, take some reads here, okay? So you, you add the abundance here, and now you put, shift some reads to here, and now you get another solution. Okay, or with different abundances, all right. So the insight we learn from this in terms of the algorithm, okay, is that the core computational part of the DNA of our assembler is basically creating a splice graph connecting each node, which you can think of as an exon, okay? Now, the important thing is the key insight from the analysis is that the abundances 
are actually very important information you need to do the assembly. So I should keep track of these numbers, and these abundances are, can be approximated by some kind of read copy count. And so I can interpret them as edge flow. Sort of the frequency of reads get mapped to each of the edges. So this is my structure, okay? And basically what, I'm trying, what we're trying to do is, again, we're trying to solve an np hot problem, which is the sparsest flow problem. What is the sparsest flow problem? <coughs> Okay, the sparsest flow problem is basically to find the smallest number of end-to-end -end flow that explain the edge flow. Okay, so there's the edge flow here, and basically you want to find multiple end-to-end -end flow, each of which is a transcript with a certain abundance that can explain the flow. And you're hoping to find the smallest number. And what we showed is that although this problem is NP-hard again, okay, it turns out that the hard instances are the ones in which the abundances are non-generic, that is, they're the same. And those we already ruled out to be not interesting and information infeasible. So by focusing on the information feasible instances, we can show that if the read length is longer than a certain number, then the algorithm will return the correct answer, and the algorithm is linear time under this condition. Okay. So, our theory extends to computing an L-critical for transcriptome assembly. Okay, so remember that L-critical for DNA assembly. We can compute the same thing for RNA assembly, analogous concept. Such that on the left, no algorithm reconstruct. On the right, our proposed algorithm can reconstruct in linear time. Okay, and our bounds here don't match in general, but it turns out that for many reference transcriptomes, they're pretty close. And so we build a software around this idea by first essentially constructing the splice graph using basic DNA assembly tools by resolving intertranscript repeat. Then after we get the splice graph, we estimate abundances using the copy counts by doing some kind of smoothing. And then finally doing the sparse decomposition, sparse flow decomposition on the transcript on the, on the splice graph to get the transcript. Okay, so I'll use my remaining three minutes here to show some evaluation. Okay, so frankly, we're not really software people, but we really want to demonstrate our ideas work. So we spent a long, long time trying to do this. So we evaluated on two data sets, two data sets. The number one data set is 135 million Illumina 50 base pair single end reads from HESC, human embryonic stem cells. The second is 110 million Illumina pair and reads from the lem lymphoblastoid transcriptome, okay? The reason why we choose these two data set is because both, in addition to having these short reads, also have long reads, pack bio reads, which they use to combine with the short reads to do assembly, which we use to create a sort of pseudo ground truth. So in our assembly comparison, we only use the short reads. We don't use the long reads, but we use the long read augmented reference transcriptome as our ground truth. Okay? So human embryonic stem cells results. So the software, what's the name of the software? Obviously, it should be Shannon. Okay. It's blue. Shannon is blue. All right. And we are comparing to a bunch of other software, okay? Soap de Novo Trans, Trans Abyss, Oasis, and Trinity, okay? On the left, we have the total number of transcript reconstructed, okay? On the second one, we have the recovery rate, recovery rate by transcript abundance. So we measure rate by the fraction in terms of abundances. We divide into transcript of different coverage, okay? So low coverage, obviously, the performance is a little bit worse. But here, we have pretty consistently better performance than the other software across different abundances, coverage. And the false positive rate, we are also the lowest, okay? So this human embryonic stem cell on the lymphoblastoid transcriptome, we have similar results, okay? 
So here the comparison was with three other software. Oasis, after a lot of effort, did not run on this data set. Okay? So this is a pair and read data set. So we have to add some uh, more some heuristics to get it worked for pair and reads. Our theory is mainly for single and read. Okay? All right. So I finish exactly at two o'clock. So information theory is about limits, what you can do. But what I showed today, I hopefully convinced you, is also a constructive theory. Because by understanding what can or cannot be done, I can actually focus my algorithm on solving those instances which can be done. Okay? And thereby overcomes computationally intractable problems by focusing on tractable instances. Thank you. <laughs>